Thank you for coming back, uh, despite of the first lecture. <laughs> So I will continue uh, discussing uh, semi-simple groups, and now I will uh, discuss Zariski-Dell subgroups. So we saw uh, the terminology appear in Tengren's talk this morning, and I will. So uh, basically, the, the topic of the conference is a study of dynamical properties related to another representations. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> you <laughs> seems to me, and uh, so but when you. Okay. Higher rank I should cons yeah. I should discuss with an organizer, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and um, so this in my lectures I will not discuss another representation, but I will discuss uh, uh, risk discrete Zariskinian subgroups. Okay, so what you can expect when you have a discrete Zariskinian subgroup, and uh, so to, to this morning there was uh, no subgroups. Basically, and now there will be a Zariski dense subgroup, and then tomorrow there will be a discrete Zariski dense subgroup. Okay, anyway, for today, I, I will just. So, what we want to introduce is uh, properties, asymptotic properties of uh, subgroups, gamma of G, and gamma will be Zariski dense. So, the terminology, I, I will come back to this notion a little later in the talk. And first, also this morning, uh, in Degren's talk, gamma was a, a high poverty group embedded in G, and we had, uh, we saw the boundary of gamma appear, and we wanted to compare it with, so in case G was the group of isometries of real high public space, we compared the boundary of gamma with the boundary of G, with the boundary of the high public space, so I will introduce an object that will play the role of this boundary in any rank. That is, not only for real high public spaces, but generally rank one groups. And this, so this object, it will be a homogeneous space of G. And it, so for the moment, I forget about gamma. I still have G that is a semi-simple Lie group. And this group will come with a very nice uh, a, a compact space. And there will be, a, which I will denote by maybe not just P, and uh, uh, P will be equipped with a transitive action of G. P is just a quotient of G. So that to define this quotient, I will need to define this subgroup P. And this subgroup P, it will, uh, it is called also, uh, it is called a minimal parabolic subgroup. So if you remember, at the end of the talk this morning, I ended up with a decomposition of the Lie algebra into root spaces. So we had the Cartan subalgebra, so it's not exactly, yeah. anyway, the space A. We had the compact, the Ali algebra of the compact part of the centralizer of A, and the sum of uh, the root spaces associated to non-zero roots. And uh, uh, we choose the so A plus inside A, which also, I didn't write the names this morning, so it is a vial chamber. So it is a connected component. It is a closure of a connected complement, component of the complement of the hyperplanes that are the, the <coughs> kernels of the roots. So you have a picture in SL3, you have a picture of this form, and you choose a connected component. And now you see the, the data of this connected component, it allows to split the space of roots into two parts, because since in the interior of the vial chamber, the root does not vanish, it is either everywhere positive or everywhere negative. Okay, so you can split sigma plus, sigma, the union of sigma plus and sigma minus, and sigma plus is a set of all roots which are non-negative on your choice of a vial chamber. And it turns out, this is a fact, that uh, actually sigma minus is, min is minus sigma plus. The key property, which is not absolutely obvious, okay, it is somehow the core of semi-simplicity is that you have as many things below the diagonal or as above the diagonal. And uh, so the Lie algebra of the group P, it is equal to you, to, you take A, you take M, but you just take the positive roots. And it turns out that this 
subvector space. For the moment, I, I'm just defining a subvector space. But actually, this is the Lie algebra. It's not very easy to, not very difficult to check. Okay, and uh, uh, it is a, it is a, a subalgebra, and you define P as the set of G's in G, so, which preserves this Lie algebra. And it turns out that the fact, it's a fact, that the Lie algebra of P is exactly P. That is, this, this algebra is actually equal to its normalizer. Okay. And uh, so it's, for the moment, it's absolutely abstract. I, I, if you don't know it, you don't understand anything. And uh, it's better to, to say exactly who the objects are in examples. So what you are doing, actually, is that if G is SL and R, then P, it is just up to conjugacy because uh, I made choices. But since all objects actually, has every choice, the group acts transitively on every choice I'm making. Uh, so this is why the choices do not matter. And uh, you can take for P just the group of upper triangular matrices. Okay, and as I promised this morning, I will not only do the example of SLN to convince you that in every classical group, all objects are very explicit. So uh, if G is uh, the symplectic group, for example, okay, uh, I should maybe I will add a sentence because doing the, okay, and what is G mod P in that case? This is a set of complete flags. A complete flag, that is, uh, this is a set of all points, xi, which are a sequence, v0, v1, uh, vn, and uh, v0 is 0. It's properly included in v1, which is a line, etc., and it's properly included in vn, which is rn. So it is a an increasing sequence, a maximal increasing sequence of subspaces of Rn. This is a set of flags, and it is actually a compact set, and this set comes with a transitive action of SL and R. And this, play, this space will play the role uh, of the boundary of the group. Whatever, you don't build a compactification because there are several choices, etc. But whatever, whatever you can try to do, in the end, your compactification, its boundary will contain copies of this. Okay. And uh, <coughs> as I promised this morning, I will do another example. So if you are okay, we do this one. The symplectic group. In the symplectic group, uh, you will, we will fix what is, we will first define the good, we will define G mod P instead of defining P, which is equivalent. So you, you will consider flags. You will do the same. You take complete flags. And now the dimension is 2n. And I will not consider the set of all flags. I will consider a proper subspace. I will consider flags such that for all i in between 0 and n, vi is totally isotropic. So remember that we are working with a space equipped with a symplectic form. Okay, and the group is an isometric group of the symplectic form. So I'm taking spaces on which the symplectic form is zero. Okay? And this is for the first spaces because you cannot, of course, uh, when you read dimension n, when you go beyond dimension n, the, 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 the space cannot be totally isotropic. Okay? And what you do is that Vn minus i. It, just, it will just be the orthogonal subspace. And when, when I mean orthogonal, it's res with respect to my chosen symplectic form. Okay? So among all flags, among the flag manifold of SLN, I'm now looking at a subspace which is clearly invariant under the symplectic group. Okay? And this is the G mod P for the symplectic groups. So P is just the stabilizer of such a flag. Okay? And if you, want, if you work with quadratic forms, you will have uh, spaces which look a bit this way. So it depends on the signature, what you have to do, but uh, you, can, uh, you, you can work it out. It's an exercise for tomorrow. What is G mod P for any group? Okay? <coughs> and so this is all I wanted to say about this space. So the, the point is that every semi-simple semi group comes with a fla space, which is called the flag manifold of the group, and which we, you can define in an abstract way by using the language of semi-simple group, if you know it. 
And if you don't know it, but you want to, you are satisfied with working with classical groups, you can still do it, actually. And now I want to, because and I, I will be interested in understanding the uh, action and the space of the risky dense subgroups of uh, G. And uh, to do this, I will define, so in, um, in rank one, let's say in real hyperbolic spaces, you know that among elements, so G mod P will be the, the G mod P will be the boundary. If G is the SO one N, G mod K is real hyperbolic space, and G mod P will be the boundary of real hyperbolic spaces. And among group, among group elements, there are very nice ones, which has, are hyperbolic isometries, and I will define an analog notion in any semi-simple group. And uh, to do this, what I will, I will first introduce a new decomposition. So this morning we 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 met the Carton decomposition, k a plus k, and now I will uh, uh, I will look at a decomposition related to this hyperbolicity property. So I will say that an element G in G, in gen I'm back to the general case, is elliptic if uh, G is conjugate to this means conjugate this tilde, at least on this board. An element belonging to the comp maximal compact subgroup. Okay, it's called an elliptic element. Uh, G is uh, uh, um, hyperbolic if G is conjugate to uh, an element of A. And I will say that G is unipotent if G is conjugate to an element of something which is which has to be thought of as a unipotent group. And it is the, here you see you have something which looks hyperbolic, something which looks elliptic, and this is the unipotent part. So it's exponential of this group. Okay, and again, this is a language that is fit for describing what happens in an abstract semi-simple group. But in, in what it means, for example, for SLN, being elliptic means being diagonalizable with uh, eigenvalues that have modulus one. Being hyperbolic means being diagonalizable with eigenvalues that are real and positive. And being unipotent means having only one as an eigenvalue. And actually. This is a notion for SLN, but any semi-simple group admits a representation whose uh, kernel is a discrete group, okay? a la, uh, so it's almost a faithful representation. And essentially, once you replace your Lie group by a linear Lie group, this is just the same. That is, being elliptic means whatever the faithful representation you take, it's just being elliptic as an element acting on the vector space, okay? having a purely imaginary eigenvalues, etc. It's just a notion of lin linear algebra. And there is a fact which just comes from linear algebra. It is a fact that uh, then for any G, fact, for any G in G, you can write G as a product of an elliptic element, a hyperbolic one, and a unipotent one, and uh, they commute to each other. And this decomposition is unique. And it's just a, a translation, an abstract translation of a fact from linear algebra. Huh? So Jordan decomposition of matrices. You can decompose a matrix. So usually you you, you state the genre de decomposition over an arbitrary field. So those two guys, you put them together. You call this the diagonalizable part. And uh, this one, you put it here, but uh, it's just the genre de decomposition in linear algebra. It's no mysterious. This nice property is that the genre de decomposition leaves semi-simple group stable. This is what it says. And uh, uh, so this morning, I introduced the carton decomposition. And the Cartan decomposition, G equals K A plus K, defined 
I, in the carton decomposition, I told you the carton component is uniquely defined by an element of G. Okay. You, you have some small choices on the K part, but on the A plus part, there is no choice. So it defines a map when you take the log of the carton component, which I will denote by kappa. Uh, it is a map from G to the vial chamber. <coughs> and now I can define... So the carton decomposition is related to norms. And now I, I will delay, define something which is related to eigenvalues. This is the Jordan decomposition. It is lambda. And what it is, so you, you write G as a product. You write its Jordan decomposition. And uh, it turns out that if you look at GH, you choose. There exists, a, sorry. GH is conjugated to an element of A, but more precisely, uh, GH is conjugated to a unique element of the exponential of A plus, which I may be denoted by A plus. Okay. What it says is just this. A plus is related to putting the eigenvalues in the right order, to ordering the eigenvalues. Okay. So what you are saying here is just, you take the diagonal part, the diagonal part is diagonalizable, so it's conjugate to a diagonal matrix. But you, what you do is you just take the absolute values of the eigenvalues of the diagonal matrix and you put them in decreasing order. And this is what it means to put it in A+. Plus. Okay, so you, you have two projections. Uh, the, here it's just, the, this projection is just the list of eigenvalues. Uh, le, sorry, the list of moduli of eigenvalues. Except that if you work in SLN, it's just a string of eigenvalues. But for example, if you work in the symplectic groups, they, there are some linear relations among the eigenvalues. You remember this morning? I, I told you that the, if you have, a, in, the, in the symplectic group, if you, in the standard representation, if you have any eigenvalue, you, you must have an in, the inverse must come as an eigenvalue somewhere because you preserve the symplectic form. Okay? So what it means to say that you arrive in this space A plus, it's just that there are some linear constraints and you take the log among the eigenvalues. Okay? And this linear constraints see something that you can write explicitly for any classical group in a very uh, simple manner. Uh, so these are the data that come from the structure of the group. And now I will introduce subgroups. Okay? And, uh, uh, so, and what, what will interest me is groups for which these G elements of the group for which this GA part, GH part, this carton component, this uh, Jordan component here, so I will call this a carton projection. And here I will call this a Jordan projection. And uh, you see this, this A plus, this is a cone in a vector space, okay? And I will look at the interior of the A plus, which I will call A plus plus. So in SLN, these are m diagonal matrices where the eigenvalues are in strictly decreasing order. So maybe if in English, I should say decreasing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> instead of non-increasing, I'm lost with terminology, so for me, I'm French, decreasing means non-increasing. <laughs> and decreasing, I, I say strictly decreasing, okay? Yes. Okay, I prefer this, so sorry. I cannot, so no, I will not be able to manage, okay? What so, does the word compact mean today? Yeah, for me, it's okay. <laughs> Co for me, compa compact means compact Hausdorff. Okay, and okay. <laughs> so you're one foot in both waters. <laughs> okay, so A++, plus plus, these are strictly decreasing eigenvalues. And what happens is that, when you have strictly decreasing eigenvalues, this part must disappear, okay? Because this part must commute with GH. So if you don't have multiplicity, you have no unipotent part. And you, so you say that if you have J, G in G, okay, such that lambda G belongs to A++, you have strictly decreasing moduli of eigenvalues. You say that it is called, that by definition, it is, you call it a loxodromic element. So again, <coughs> example, this is the definition. 
in SL and R. This is saying that the, uh, all moduli of eigenvalues of G are different from each other. And uh, here comes a, a fact that saying that uh, uh, G is loxotromic, it's equivalent to saying that G has an attractive an attracting fixed point in the flag manifold. Okay, that is, since all eigenvalues are different, you can put them in order, okay, and look at the flag that you define by taking the leading eigenvalue, then adding a vector by taking the next eigenvalue, and the next, and the next, and the next. And you are defining a particular flag associated to a loxodromic element. And if you look at the dynamic on this point, the, so this flag, uh, you, you will have a fixed point, which I will denote by psi g plus, and it turns out that you can find a neighborhood of psi g plus u, such that g and u converges to psi as n goes to infinity. That is, you smash the neighborhood towards psi. This is what I call an attracting fixed point. And having this dynamical property is equivalent to being loxotropic. And in that case, you can look. So the picture is that you have this very nice attracting fixed point, and you can look at the set of guys which do not go to psi g plus. So a set of, which I will denote by qg minus, this is a set of other points in the flag manifold that do not converge. You do not converge to psi, you do not get smashed to psi g plus. And just by looking at what happens when you have an explicit matrix, you can see that this, this is actually a proper algebraic submanifold of P. <coughs> I will come back. So why do I speak of an algebraic submanifold of P? It's because even if my group is not a linear group, actually, everywhere in the definition, I could, when I define P, instead of working with G, I can work with the adjoint group of G. Okay? And this space is actually a homogeneous space of the adjoint group of G, so that it is an uh, unhomogeneous, um, and actually even of the full automorphism group of the Lie algebra, which is an algebraic group, and this space is actually, uh, viewed this way, it is an algebraic manifold. Okay? So I can speak of an algebraic submanifold as a space. And uh, let me describe what is this. So we have now we have this picture. If you have a loxodromic element, you have its fixed point, and you have, I could say, I don't know, the unstable subvariety or whatever, the set of guys which do not converge to psi g plus when I go to infinity. And uh, I can describe, uh, when I'm telling you this is a proper algebraic submanifold, you could, we can check what it is in case uh, G is SLN, and in case G is SLN. So, in general, this in particular, say, saying that G is loxodromic uh, is, is equivalent to saying that G minus 1 is loxodromic. So, you have also a fixed point for the inverse dynamics, and it turns out that this fixed point is rather clear that it will lie on this subvariety. Okay? And uh, it, when G is SLN, what happens is the following, that you have the <coughs> you, 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 will, uh, uh, you have the fixed point, the attractive fixed point for G, and uh, you have the attracting fixed point for uh, G minus 1. So what it is, it is the, in this one, you see, you see you choose a diagonalization basis, okay, where the eigenvalues decrease. And for this one, you choose a diagonalization basis where the eigenvalues increase. So actually, what, what you do here is just you have to reverse the order of the basis. Just what you do when you go from this point to this point. So if you look carefully at what it means for the flags, it means that for any i, 
these two spaces, VI and the other one, they are in direction. Okay, because you are reversing the order of the things you do. So here you have half of the basis, uh, part of the basis, and here's the remainder part of the basis. Okay? And uh, uh, so when I have two flags, if I take any two flags, if they have this property, I will say that they are in general position. And if you carefully check what I did for constructing these fixed points, you will see that QG minus, it's exactly the set of flags eta, which is not in general position, with xi g minus. Okay, that is the flags that are related to this point. Okay, so you, you have to write it carefully. Okay, but this is exactly what happens. That the flags that do not go to xi g plus, it means that they entertain a too close relation to xi xi g minus. Okay, and it's this relation in case of SLNR. It's exactly this one. So again, I could take the symplectic group and write relation properties of this form and give you a description. I could take any classical groups, and there would be a description of this form. And I will now what I will do is make this, which is very for the moment rather clear, into something absolutely awful. And what is the property? So in general. When you look at the action of G acting now on the pairs of two flags, uh, that is, here you see you have being in general position is the property of the pair of, of a pair of two flags. Okay? And this property is invariant. So it means that it is the property of a certain orbit on G mod P cron G mod P. And the property fact, again, sorry for all the facts, that there exists. A unique open G orbit. And again, for the SLNR case, this is just this orbit. Okay? And uh, QG minus, so let me, I will give it a name, I don't know, uh, uh, let me call it OG. Okay? <coughs> inside GP cross GP, so the unique open orbit, and uh, QG minus, in general, I, I just repeat now this property, this is the set of eta in uh, G mod P, such that psi G minus eta does not belong to the open orbit. That is what I'm saying. I'm just translating this property of SLNR into a property that makes sense in a least semi simple group. So it's not essential, but what I'm saying is that this, and since everything can be worked out for the, in the same way for the adjoint group, actually all these spaces are algebraic subvarieties. Everything is algebraic on this picture, actually. Okay. So, uh, up to a cover. No, no, is this picture here because it's, you know, this orbit is an algebra. Oh, there, but I mean, not G, right? No, 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 no. The, no, no, no. the double yeah, cover. On this picture, on this picture, every. G mod P is an algebra variety. The open orbit is a Zariski open subset, etc. And for the same reason, I can define a Zariski dense subgroup. So when you have an algebra variety, a Zariski dense subset is a subset that is not contained in any proper algebra subvariety. Okay, so if you have gamma, that is a subgroup of G, I will say that gamma is Zariski dense. If, when you look at the adjoint action of gamma, so this is a subset of the automorphism group of the Lie algebra, so now I'm back to linear groups and algebraic varieties, etc. I ask that it is Zariski dense. At least, <coughs> in, uh, yes, I put the neutral component. So it's a risky death. Just what it means. Why? 
Why did I speak of Jordan decomposition before introducing the risk in the group? Why did I speak of loxodromic elements? Because there is a theorem. So you were very brave to stay until this theorem. You will be rewarded. It's good. Ah, maybe I don't put the right authors. So I think there is the first proof by uh, Goldscheid and Margulis, and actually a much clearer one by Prasad. And uh, the theorem is that uh, uh, is gamma inside G is a risky dense. Then gamma contains loxodromic elements. So this is why I needed to introduce your sodromic elements, because now I will use them. So what, uh, what it says, so you, you, have, you have nice matrices. Not every matrix is necessarily looks, uh, hyperbolic, but you have something that has a very hyperbolic behavior. So what does it say? For example, we li let us go back to hyperbolic geometry and let us even take uh, the first case, that is, we take G to be SL to R. And uh, saying uh, that gamma is a risky dense, in that case, it's just saying that uh, gamma does not fix a scalar product on R2. Now first, I should say that gamma is a risky dense. It's the same as what is called, in that case, it is the same as what is called non-elementary in uh, hyperbolic geometry. And uh, it is the same as saying that you don't fix a scalar product on R2. You don't fix a line in R2. And you don't fix the union of two lines, of two distinct lines in R2. <coughs> Because what is the, 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 what is the converse of the Zareski dense? It's contained in an algebraic subgroup. And what I'm giving you implicitly here is the classification of all maximal algebraic subgroups of SL2. Because here you don't want to be contained in a conjugate of SO2. Here, you don't want to be contained in a conjugate of the group of triangular matrices, which is a proper algebraic subgroup. And here, you don't want to be contained in the union of the group of diagonal matrices with the set of anti-diagonal matrices. Huh? This set, is a, this group, is exactly the stabilizer of the union of two lines. Okay? And what I'm saying is that as soon as you are not contained in some conjugate of these groups, you are actually Zariski dense. So the, the point is that Zariski density is something that is easy to verify. It's not some abstract. See, if I give you explicitly matrices and I ask you whether the set, the groups that generate is Zariski dense, you will do it. Okay. So it's a, so it's a, it's a, it's a you, can, you can check it. Okay. And in particular, in this case, you see, uh, If I give you a set of matrices, you will see whether they are all orthogonal or whether they are all have a common fixed point, etc. And what I'm saying is that in this case, then the theorem says that then, easy to prove in that case, then gamma contains some gamma which is up to conjugacy of this form. Uh, I should put. I, I can remove the plus or minus because I can take the square. Okay. You can take contain the hyperbolic matrix for some uh, positivity. This is what the theorem says. But in SL3, for example, it's, uh, well, so you, you have a bit more of cases to rule out to check that you are Zariski dense, and then you know that you will contain a matrix which has three different three, eigen, three, uh, three different positive eigenvalues. And uh, so now we will start introducing, uh, you will use this property to start introduce the first object uh, that is related to the risky dense groups. Ah, 
I need my sector. I ask, is, it, is this theorem, it's like R points of the group G, so if the SL2C, there's no locks or the way you've defined them for a random convex token pack thing, is there? What, what do you mean? For SL2C? Yes, what reason? What because there's a rotation, which will be a unicomplex number, there, there's always going to be one that doesn't have a rotation? No, 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 because you, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. So here comes the Earth theorem that is due to Benoit. And uh, it says the following that if you have gamma inside G, that is Aristides. Then when you look at the action of gamma on the, this flag manifold, G must be, it admits a smallest. Non empty, close, invariant subset. So this set appeared in the talk by Tang Ren this morning because he told us that he would consider equivalence map in his, that he wanted to study representations of hyperbolic groups inside semi simple groups, and that this representation would come with, uh, so he didn't mention that space, but. Uh, I'm spoiling his next talk. And actually, his representations will come with a map, a continuous map, from the hyperbolic, the group of boundary of gamma towards, maybe not this, sometimes not this flag manifold, but towards the flag manifold. Okay. And say for the moment, this one. Okay. And in that case, the range of this map will be a closed subset of G mod P. And by construction, this map is gamma equivalence. It will be a an invariant closed subset for gamma, and the action there is minimal. So this set will be the, minim the minimal set. The, yes, uh, the limit set is called. It's lambda by gamma. And this, this set is called the, the, is called the limit set of gamma. Okay. So, so somehow you could say that when the representation, the group is a range of an another representation, this limit set will be the range of the associated equivariant map between boundaries. Okay. But it exists in the fact that you have such a set is a general fact for any Zariski dense group. And I will prove something now for the first time, maybe the only one in the talk. <coughs> I will just define, uh, I will define uh, lambda gamma as being the closure. I will look at all the Klein G plus where G runs among all loxodromic elements. Okay, so I have I have my set, I have all these fixed points, okay, and I take all limit points of all fixed points and I define lambda gamma this way. And what I'm saying is that this is the smallest, uh, it's non-empty because there are some loxodromic elements, okay? And I need to prove that every gamma orbit, the closure of every gamma orbit contains lambda gamma. Huh? It's just equivalent to the statement. So I take, if I take SA in P, I claim that uh, the closure of the orbit of SA contains lambda gamma, which amounts to say that the closure of the orbit of SA contains every attractive fixed point of every loxodromic element. And uh, why this is true? I carefully prepared everything, so it will be very quick. Because uh, you have eta, okay, and uh, you you somewhere so eta is somewhere, and somewhere you have psi g plus, and here you have the unstable variety q g minus the guys that do not converge to psi g plus. So if eta does not belong to psi g minus, we know that g n of, of eta. 
converges to xi g plus. So it's okay. The so, uh, closure of the orbit contains xi g plus. So now comes the bad case, the bad case, the case where you are here. So if eta belongs to this subvariety, and now you, you remember that I, I, I emphasize the fact that this variety was an algebraic subvariety. So the risky density tells me that there exists some gamma in gamma, such that gamma eta does not belong to QG minus. Okay, because since QG minus is an algebraic variety, the so set of gamma such that gamma eta still belongs to QG minus is an algebraic subset. So since gamma is the risky dense, I can find someone that does not belong to this algebraic subset. Okay, and then you have eta that is here, you move it out by gamma eta, and then you are okay, because when you do gn of gamma eta, this will go to xi g plus. Okay, so I don't write all the details, okay? So you see that for free, once you correctly understand the statement of, uh, of existence of loxodromic elements, you are producing some already uh, surprising uh, dynamical behavior, okay? Some uh, actually very strong dynamical behavior. And I would like to introduce another object that is, uh, so I don't know the contents of the next lecture of the other speakers, but surely it will play a role, I hope so. And uh, so let me draw a picture to explain why I still need something. I guess while there is uh, other data that is of interest. So let us draw the picture in hyperbolic space. So in hyperbolic space, what we are doing is the following. We have in hyperbolic space, g mod k, which is h, can be compactified by, act by adding at the boundary g mod p. And in that case, what we are doing is that we start from a point, any point. And this is a classical picture in hyperbolic geometry. We look at the orbit of this point under gamma. And we look at its accumulation point on the boundary. And it's a fact that this set lambda gamma that we construct in that case, it is just, you take an orb the orbit, you take the intersection of the orbit with the boundary. The intersection of the closure of the orbit with the boundary. And this is just a limit set. It's the same object. Okay? So what it describes you is that when, when, you, when you are an observer standing at some point, and you look where the orbit is going, and you are looking in which directions the orbit is accumulating at infinity. This is where the limit set is describing. Even if we choose another presentation, with, we don't see g mod p as part of a compactification of g mod k in general, but still, the philosophy is the same. This says something as which direction you are taking when you go to infinity. And there is another, in higher rank, okay, the observer can also look at what happens in a vial chamber, that is, you have this vector value distance that we introduced this morning. And there are two choices. Either you look which direction you go to, but you could also put back, that is, you have all these gamma zero, and you can put them back in the vial chamber by using the Cartan projection. Okay? And you can also say, okay, I'm sitting here, and now I only look in the vial chamber. And what do I see? Okay? And the purpose of describing this is, uh, the, so I will introduce a new notion of L gamma, and L gamma will be a subset just of the vial chamber. Okay, and it is called the limit cone. And uh, it was introduced by Lenoir. So what is a limit cone? It's just what I, it's just, what I just uh, described here. So you look at the Cartan projection, and you restrict it towards the, your subgroup. So it gives you a set inside the vial chamber. So when, when I was young, I, I wrote the Cartan projection as mu, because lambda was for Jordan, Jordan projection. And I think in Eve's papers, it was written as mu. But then we, we started doing a, a random works on group. 
<laughs> and mu was the law of the random work, so we had to change notation. That's simple. It's still very hard for me to, to write kappa. Yeah. <laughs> 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 mu log mu, why this change? <laughs> no, no, because for now, mu, mu is a probability measure now for me. <laughs> 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 okay. So what is what is the limit cone? So you, you now the situation is just a linear situation. I forget about the geometry. Okay, and my situation is that I have some set E inside some vector space, and I want to to describe the set of limit directions of this set. So I, I call the asymptotic cone of E. This is just the set of limit directions. So this is a set of all. Uh, this is a set of all v in v, such that there exists a sequence vn of elements of the set E, and there exists a uh, vn, the norm of vn goes to infinity, but you ask that there exists a sequence tn of numbers, such that tn vn goes to v. So it's much more much more easy to, to picture than to, to, to write. What it means is just this. So you, you can, don't, don't, don't read this awful formal definition. What I'm just saying is that I have a vector space. I put an observer at zero, and I have some points, my set E, okay? And I look at all directions which I can reach by taking a sequence in E that goes to infinity. It's just what I'm saying, okay? So when you do this for the set kappa of gamma, so the asymptotic cone of kappa of gamma inside A plus, it is called the limit cone. Ah, I will keep this. So here comes the second part. Uh, sorry, would you mind putting a little bit more up the right pole? Yes, but this one is... This one... This way? So the, there are several statements about this limit cone. So L gamma inside uh, A plus uh, is a closed cone. For the moment, it's okay because every asymptotic cone, but uh, uh, it's convex, which is absolutely not trivial, and it has non-empty interior. And also, uh, L gamma is also equal <coughs> to the closure. So I told you there is a, the carton decomposition, the carton projection kappa, but you also have the uh, uh, Jordan decomposition, that is the one that is related to eigenvalues. And actually, when you have the set of Jordan decomposition, it's a, it's a priori a discrete set, but you can make it a continuous set by allowing to multiply guy by uh, real numbers, and then you can take the closure, and this is also the same uh, object. And uh, the, the last, this last formula is some kind, it's some kind of uh, abstract version of the spectral radius formula. The spectral radius formula it tells you that the spectral radius of a matrix is a limit as n goes to infinity of the norm of g to the n to the power 1 over n. Okay? And uh, actually, I told you Carton decomposition is related to norm and Jordan decomposition is related to eigenvalues. So you can this, you can restate it by saying that when you take 1 over n, so kappa, 
of G to the n, the carton, so this, this guy, you reinterpret it as being the e carton component, this goes and as, as n goes to infinity to the Jordan decomposition. And somehow the, the statement here that the asymptotic cone of the carton projections is just the cone spanned by the Jordan projection, it's a kind of a version of this. Okay? Don't know if, I don't know if it is enlightening for you. And, uh, so I think I, what I just would like to do is to, to, to give a, a converse somehow of the existence of loxodromic elements. I, I, I was, I so somehow I'm done with uh, the general results about the risky dense subgroups that were mentioned that will be used uh, in more concrete examples. And I would like to build you an example. So it was mentioned this morning. It is an example of Schottky groups. So how to build the risky dense subgroups. This actually. So uh, this morning, uh, Tegren mentioned the uh, short key groups. Uh, I will give you precisely the construction. So uh, this is the construction that is uh, very classical in hyperbolic uh, geometry. So when you want to, in hyperbolic geometry, when you want to construct, uh, so these are the first example of convex co compact subgroups, you take uh, uh, two. Isometries say uh, G minus G and G plus. So you have a G and uh, sorry. You take two hyperbolic elements in hyperbolic ge geometry and uh, G and H, and you suppose that they are uh, attracting and repulsing fixed points on the boundary are, dis are distinct from each other. And then you know that if uh, they are if you up to replacing them by very big powers, you know that you can find four neighborhoods of those four points which have an uh, empty two by two empty intersection and which has a property that each time, for example for G, each time I take a point that is not in the neighborhood of G minus, G will smash it in G plus. Okay, this is a chutky picture. And due to all the constructions we did of loxodromic elements, this picture can be extended to higher rank so in higher rank, so you see that actually in this picture, I don't use G mod K. It's just a picture on the boundary in hyperbolic geometry. And this picture, I can extend it to higher rank. So in higher rank, I will take, again, say, <coughs> two loxodromic elements. So I will have um, somewhere QG minus. And on QG minus, I will have Xi G minus. But somewhere also, I have uh, uh, Q, maybe I should not use two colors. It's a, it was a mistake. Uh, I will do one color for G, one color for H. Thank you. <laughs> so, you have uh, uh, so those two varieties. So here it's QG minus, here you have QG plus. Okay, and somewhere else you have H, and I assume that everything is far away from. Uh, Q, uh, QH plus, Xi H plus, so that I have another variety which I call QG plus, and another variety, so I have a Xi H minus, no, I'm absolutely lost with notation, and another variety, so it's QH minus, okay, and you see that actually what I will do is that instead of playing with neighborhoods of only of the points, I will play with neighborhoods also of the varieties. So for example, for G, you, up to replacing G by a very large power, I can take a tubular neighborhood of Xi G minus and assume that this tubular, the complement of this tubular neighborhood is smashed by G very close to Xi G plus. Okay? And you can play the same game. Uh, with all three other people in this picture, which be becomes a bit hard to understand. 
But still, when you write it, it works. And uh, so that uh, if neither point belongs to, if Xi G plus does not belong to the union of the three other proper subvarieties, what I will build this way is a discrete subgroup of uh, G, of my semi-simple D group, which will be uh, uh, actually a free group. Okay? And the limit set will be a counter set, which will be closely located to close to the four points here. Okay? And this is an example of an Anosov representation of the free group. And uh, so you could ask, is it Zariski dense, which is not absolutely warranted by the picture, but being Zariski dense is, uh, is actually true up to perturbation. That is, uh, in a generic group is Zariski dense. So if you move a bit the point, move a bit the generator, it, the picture will remain true, will, will still hold, okay? but the group will become Zariski dense. Okay? So here, here is the first example of Zariski dense group. Thank you very much for your attention. When the group is not discrete in Zariski dense, I mean, we expect no, it to no, no. be everything. Well, 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 the group, if you are Zariski dense, sorry, if the group is simple, so if you are Zariski dense, you are either discrete, discrete or. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because the Lie algebra is an ideal. My bad. Okay. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. You, I can't believe it's stupid. No, 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 it's okay. So, so yeah, no, I should have mentioned it that actually being Zariski dense is most interesting when you are discrete. Because uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 in semi simplicity, so the Lie algebra of a Zariski dense, of the, if you take a closed Zariski dense subgroup, its Lie algebra is an ideal of the full group. So, since, uh, this, since just by uh, the Zariski density forces this, so you know that the Lie algebra will be a sum of simple ideals. So, you have very few possibilities for the closure. Okay. So essentially, the study of Zariski dense subgroups is mostly the study of the discrete Zariski dense subgroup. It's a, so thank you for asking. I have a question. I mean, you could have done like everything in the generality of just the semi simple real algebraic group. I mean, do you gain anything by just this thing? No. no, it's just that I, I, I did not want to say algebraic group. Okay. But I still I stayed it, but I did not want. Right, but anyway, like you always have to go to a joint representation and then you have to go to real algebraic groups to discuss all these notions. So yes, but what, what is, uh, yes, what is an algebraic group? You can define by polynomials. Well, but what, right? if you so want yes, to, what if you want to lift a spin? No, 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 it's just a technical difficulty. So, uh, well, ex essentially, I, I don't use non-linear non -linear semi-simple groups. I'm just working with linear. I'll say, everywhere, I could just say a linear semi-simple group. Right. And a linear semi-simple group is always a connected component of the identity of an algebraic semi-simple group. But I did not want to define an algebraic group. Okay, then you could yeah. just say linear group and then you are already just talking yes, about yes, matrices yes, and yes, then yes, you yes, don't yes, have yes. to discuss a, a joint group between every second. You are right. Yeah, okay. Yes. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's thank the speaker now.